morning. Um, now, first, let me, as a visitor to this very beautiful part of the country, um, the traditional lands of the Durrambul people, uh, pay my respects to elders past and present. And thanks to um, Arts Queensland for inviting me to share my thoughts with you. Um, I'm here because of all the things that I'm involved in, directing opera and directing festivals, and admit, admittedly these are mostly city-based pursuits. My engagement in regional Australia is undoubtedly the area of arts practice that I care most passionately about. Um, yesterday I flew up from my office on South Bank in Brisbane, but uh, my home for the last 10 years has been 80 acres of heaven in the locality of Yowri, just outside the small town of Cabago, um, population 400, near Bermagui on the far south coast of New South Wales, um, the traditional lands of the Yuan nation, the nation of the Black Duck. Um, and down there I'm the chair of South East Arts, uh, one of the 14 New South Wales regional arts boards overseen by the peak body, Regional Arts New South Wales, upon whose board I also serve, uh, alongside colleagues from all over regional New South Wales. And indeed one of the things that appealed to me in taking on the role of Artistic Director of Upper Queensland uh, last year was the opportunity to engage with Queensland's regional landscape. Um, by implementing some bold creative strategies, we aim to make a lasting impact on the regional arts uh, scene in Australia, and I'll return to that later. Now, this conversation on, about excellence is one that keeps coming up for me and for many of my colleagues in regional arts. So, when I was asked to um, speak recently at the Vice-Chancellor's Awards for Excellence at um, Lismore Southern Cross University, I thought it was a good opportunity to, to try it out um, on, uh, on a new audience. Um, and it really did seem to strike a chord there. So I've, and I've since been approached to expand on it elsewhere. So I thought this, was, this articulate, con articulate conference uh, might be another opportunity to riff on this idea. It's an idea that's very close to my heart and it's perhaps shared by um, some of you in this room. Um, I, hope, I hope you like it. Excellence, capital E. <clears throat> it's a wonderful word, an uncompromising word, an aspirational word, a noble, distinguished, reaching, shining, stretching, striving word. It's a word that's out and proud, a word to say with purpose and consequence. Unfortunately, it's a word that has sometimes been sidelined to make way for more democratic language. And in the already limited area of public discourse set aside for regional arts in Australia, it does seem to have been utterly banished. Um, I'm going to just leave this as the holding <laughs> image for you. It's a beautiful image from our recent production of uh, Abandon in, uh, with Dance North um, uh, up in Townsville. It's just there for you to, to contemplate. It's certainly a very beautiful image. Um, and I do apologise for my PowerPoint skills, which are not so excellent. Um, I haven't, uh, I'm not a big fan of the PowerPoint presentation, but this, uh, I just collected a few uh, images for you. It's more of a sort of slide show, really. So, for those of you, those of us <coughs> who are out and proud defenders of excellence in the arts, the McMaster Review, Supporting Excellence in the Arts from Measurement to Judgment, written about five years ago by the former Edinburgh Festival director Sir Brian McMaster for the then UK government, makes a juicy reading. The time has come, said uh, Britain's Head of Culture, receiving the review, to reclaim the word excellence from its historic and elitist context and to accept that the highest quality and the broadest audience can go hand in hand. Now, McMaster was well aware that the use of the E word in the title of his review was a linguistic retro shift with important cultural implications. Here's how he introduces his first chapter, Encouraging Excellence, Innovation and Risk-Taking. It's quite a long quote, so bear with me. I want to address the vital question of language 
he says. There is a fundamental mismatch between the way we talk about culture and the values we attach to it. The language we use has become tainted and the terms we use, art for art's sake, the right to fail, risk, innovation, let alone excellence, have all acquired accretions of meaning in recent years that have blunted or distorted what we want to say. Excellence itself is sometimes dismissed as an exclusive, canonical and heritage approach to cultural activity. I refute this. We need to be clear from the outset what we mean when we say excellence, innovation and risk-taking. Excellent culture, he says, takes and combines complex meanings, gives us new insights and new understandings of the world around us and is relevant to every single one of us. It is why culture is so important to societies that flourish. If culture is excellent, it can help us make sense of our place in the world, ask questions we would not otherwise have asked, understand the answers in ways we couldn't otherwise have understood, and appreciate things we have never before experienced. The greater its power to do these things, the more excellent the cultural experience. The best definition of excellence I have heard is that excellence in culture occurs when an experience affects and changes an individual. An excellent cultural experience goes to the root of living. This idea may seem abstract, but it is in fact quite concrete. We have all been to performances that have been good technically, but stopped short of being excellent. We can train artists to a degree of technical ability so that their work is of high quality. Excellence is another quality altogether." End of quote. So what does a report written in the UK um, a few years ago have to do with excellence in the arts in regional Australia? Well, it's about language. I share McMaster's concern about arts language having acquired accretions of meaning that have blunted and distorted what we want to say. And I've noticed in the 10 years that I've lived in regional Australia that there's a troubling disconnect in the terminology between metropolitan arts and regional arts, that words like excellent, global, elite, are used far too infrequently in the, uh, the, the narrative surrounding regional arts. So I want to sound a tiny alarm. We need to challenge the numbingly benign, feel-good, bland language that's habitually used to describe cultural, intellectual and creative life in regional Australia because it is doing us a disservice. It's a product of a national mindset that either can't see or underestimates our dynamism and our potential impact on the national cultural landscape. What do I mean by this? How can soft language be undermining and limiting regional arts? Well, here's one example. The federal government's national cultural policy, Creative Australia, a 10-year vision for the arts in Australia, sadly doesn't look like it's, it will have its chance to see out even its first year, which is a shame because we all had such hopes uh, for it, and indeed there are some terrific initiatives and inspiring ideas in Creative Australia. Some really exciting new directions um, to grab hold of um, and, and run with. Which is what I said when I was asked by the Australian uh, to comment when the policy was released by the then Arts Minister Simon Crean. And because of the print deadlines, <coughs> they only gave me about two hours to scan it before making my comments. So my first impression of the document was, was very broad, but actually it was very positive. But there was something about this document that immediately troubled me, and it was a language thing. Scanning through the policy for what it said specifically about the arts in regional Australia, not only was I disappointed that that section started on page 102 of a 121-page document, and that no new money was injected into this spectacularly underfunded yet over-delivering sector, it seemed to me that the language became softer and less aspirational the further one travelled back towards the back of the document, towards the section called Regional Development and Social Dividends Through Community-Based Arts and Cultural Programs. 
Now, throughout the Creative Australia document, the word excellence is used liberally, and that's a great thing. Indeed, up to five times on some pages. Goal three of the five policy goals is to support excellence and the special role of artists and their creative collaborators as the source of original work and ideas, including telling Australian stories. So excellence is right embed embedded at the, in, the, in the principle of the document. And I'm looking forward to Opera Queensland eventually <laughs> competing for these, the, the proposed uh, specially created excellence pool for funding for the 28 MPA, our major performing arts companies. Excellence is cited as an aspiration for creative industries and training and all sorts of directions that intersect with the work we do in regional Australia. But in the section that specifically talked about regional arts, I'm sad to say the word excellence is not used once. And the language has changed, notably. Suddenly, in the document, we're talking about arts making regional communities resilient, inclusive, cohesive and positive, linking and unifying people from different backgrounds and circumstances, fostering understanding and building a common sense of purpose, which they do, of course, but can't they also be excellent? <laughs> Examples are given of projects that sound fantastic, community choirs working with professional musicians singing locally composed songs, young Australians benefiting from participating in youth theatre groups where they gain the opportunity to write and perform stories relevant to their peers, people using their artistic talent to build the confidence of others, such as textile artists working with refugee women, to explore and make sense of their migration stories. Now, I've been up to my neck in community arts for the last 10 years. It's truly one of the joys of my life. Community projects in Perth, Sydney, Adelaide and at home on the South Coast have uh, been highlights of my career as an artist and as an artistic director. Some of my most amazing experiences as an audience member have been at arts events in community environments. So I'm pretty miffed that there's no suggestion in Creating Australia, our national cultural policy document, that this kind of work and regional artists can also produce uh, good, excellent and even great art. Why is there such a lack of faith in this possibility? Why is, such high, why is high artistic aspiration expected in metropolitan centres, but not, seemingly not in Rockhampton? Where's the excellence pools for regional activity? In fact, we're with awards for excellence last night. Now, I know there are a lot of Arts Queensland people here, and I, uh, I don't mean to in any way be critical, but I had a quick scan of the uh, Arts Queensland Regional Arts Development Fund Guidelines Handbook, um, which in 30 pages also shows zero use of the word excellence or excellent, and the, only once is the word quality used in the foreword. The word quality is also used very sparingly in the, arts, in the Queensland Government's Artbeat Regional Arts and Cultural Strategy 2010 to 2014, and the phrase artistic excellence is used twice in relation to the very excellent Queensland Music Festival. But there are, also, there are all sorts of other really lovely words and words we all use and embrace. Rich, diverse, innovative, vibrant, meaningful. But they're not the same thing as quality and excellence. And I'm starting to get the feeling that regional artists are being talked down to, that less is expected of us. Whether that's the case or the concept of excellence is seen as somehow threatening or unrealistic or too highfalutin or elitist, it's clear to me that there's something amiss with the narrative around community arts um, and the arts in regional Australia in this, in this area. This reticence to talk up our artistic ambitions, to reach higher, to demand the very best of ourselves and others is eerily familiar. <clears throat> It uh, reminds me strangely of the reticence that many women feel about demanding their rightful place in the boardroom or executive office. And the warm and fuzzy vernacular around the narrative suggests and reinforces a, le a lack of sector dynamism and rigour that, as an artist working in this area, I find inaccurate and very annoying. <laughs> um, I strongly believe that our regional artists could and should be claiming a larger slice of funding, the funding pie, more corporate and philanthropic uh, support, claiming more kudos, 
and inspiring bigger audiences for our work. But until we assert our strengths and seize a more central place, our rightful place, in my opinion, in the national cultural narrative, we will continue to play the poor cousin to the excellent elite metropolitan art sector. So how do we seize the narrative? Now obviously you can't claim excellence if the work isn't, and not everything is. It's not, not everything is excellent in the metro sense, uh, sector either. Um, and not everyone wants to be excellent, and that's absolutely fair enough. But there must be a space in the narrative, in our use of language, and in policy and practice, reserved for at least the potential for excellence and the aspiration to excellence. <clears throat> Now, unsurprisingly, given his 14 years running Welsh National Opera and 14 years running the Edinburgh Festival, one of the great things about McMaster's Supporting Excellence report was its practicality. That in order to propagate excellence, we must examine ways to create the conditions where excellence can flourish. To continue the gardening analogy, um, if excellence is properly uh, nurtured, it will respond to the soil and nutrients um, of different landscapes. And as an artist and artistic director living in regional Australia, I find abundant inspiration for excellence in the physical beauty and power of the natural world that surrounds me. But I'm also inspired by my connection with other artists around the world who choose to live and work outside of big cities for exactly this reason. And there are countless examples of artists whose excellence flows um, as, a uh, as a creative response to the region that they love. Composers like Benjamin Britten, who so loved the wild coastline and, the pe and people of Suffolk that his operas were suffused with regional atmosphere. Tan Dun, born in a small village in the Hunan province of China. As a child, he was fascinated by the role of the shaman in his village, who conducted rituals and ceremonies with, and made music with organic objects such as rocks and water. Now, Tan Dun identifies very strongly as a regional artist. He still creates music made with rocks and water, only now he does it in the concert halls of Berlin, New York, or Sydney. When I was the director at the Sydney Festival, um, I spent hours out on ferries talking about this with Mike Shepherd, the founder and joint artistic director of Nehigh Theatre, uh, one of my very favourite theatre companies in the world. Nehigh certainly makes excellent theatre. Their shows are acclaimed around the world, from New York uh, to, to the West End of London. They've been nominated for multiple Tony Awards. They've appeared in the most prestigious festivals on the planet. Um, and this year they clock up their 30th year in the, in, uh, with an Australian tour of Brief Encounter, a stunning stage adaptation of the classic film, which uh, the notorious Ben Brantley of the New York Times called a delicate, whimsical, exquisite creation. But best of all, the very excellent Knee High Theatre is based in Mike's hometown of Truro in Cornwall, a town about a third of the size of Rockhampton. I love the way that Mike describes the relationship between Nehi's work and the place that they make it. I love their spirit of adventure, of global, uh, intrepid global travel and outlook. Here's a, a, another quite substantial quote from Mike, Mike Shepard, <coughs> Artistic Director of Nehi. We are based in a collection of barns on the South Cornish coast, at the top of a hill where the road ends and the vast horizon stretches far beyond Dodman Point. By their very nature, the barns let the weather in and out again. A large multi fuel burner needs to be stoked and fed for rehearsals. There's barely any mobile phone reception and nowhere to pop out for a quick cappuccino. The isolation of the barns and the need to cook and keep warm provides a real and natural focus for our flights of imagination. This is not conceit. It's a radical choice that informs all aspects of our work. Although much of our work is now co-produced with larger theatres, we always try to start the creative process at the barns, to be inspired by our environment and where we work. These elemental and charged spaces add a physical and vocal robustness to our performance style. Nehi are an ever-changing ensemble, a kind of strange family, many of whom come from or have chosen to live in Cornwall. 
the extreme southwest tip of the British Isles. Outsiders, left-handers, engaging with the world with a sense of community and identity. <clears throat> As King Mark says in Tristan and Isolde, we don't look inland, there's not much point. No, outward, outward lies the way. Inland, there's little to write home about and much less to say. Cornwall is our physical and spiritual home. <clears throat> we draw inspiration from the landscapes, history, people and culture. I returned home to Cornwall 30, 30 years ago to make theatre. It was a place where you could make things happen." End quote. Nehi's deep connection to Cornwall and their global perspective defines them. The fact that they're grounded in an authentic culture, yet utterly equipped for the zeitgeist, speaking with a confident, broadly accented voice within the national and international discourse. This makes Nehi hugely desirable for festivals and presenters. Now I know that there's a potential Nehi theatre in any number of Australian regional centres, but how many of them share Nehi's sense of self-belief that the work that they make for local audiences is good enough for the world? Uh, when I visited uh, Nehi, um, I visited them in their uh, new um, 650-seat dome-shaped tent, the Asylum, which was placed in the middle of a paddock in Truro. Um, it could not possibly have been, um, uh, there, there could not possibly have been a more regional experience than I had. I went to see, uh, I went into the Asylum and I drank uh, local wine and I ate local cheeses and I saw a local show, uh, which I promptly picked up and um, invited to the Sydney Festival. So uh, it's an extraordinary <coughs> regional uh, experience, the Nehi experience, but it is utterly global. And more and more Australian artists, uh, Australian regional artists are thinking globally, and this is very much, I believe, a way forward, a way of shifting the narrative. Down on the south coast in New South Wales, I'm involved with uh, Bermagui's Four Winds Festival, a biennial um, Easter outdoor chamber music festival, um, which is now co-commissioning work with, the, uh, with one of the UK's finest music festivals, the Albra Festival, um, inspired by the vast skies and moody seas of the Suffolk coast. Composer Benjamin Britten founded the Albra Festival in uh, 1958. And in Burmese Four Winds, they have a natural partner. Both coastlines are rugged and uncompromising in winter and in summertime. Both fishing hamlets are good old-fashioned tourist towns. And they both have festivals and communities who care about the experience of excellent music making. For this reason, Four Winds, <laughs> under the, their chair, Sheena Baujan, is uh, undergoing a radical transformation. And after 20 years of putting up with a charmingly shabby temporary bushland venue on, with a torn canopy, no power, no water, and not even a per permanent stage for the performers, the Four Winds team decided that that just wasn't good enough. Um, wasn't good enough for their artists and not good enough for their audiences. If the audiences were making the effort to come to listen to world-class musicians, Four Winds needed a world-class venue. The music deserved it, they declared, the artists deserve it, and the community deserves it. This, I have to hasten to add, is the working class community of Bermagui, population 1,500, with an average yearly wage of $35,000. $35,000, yes, a year. But I, I, you know, the, the, that community is augmented by an, an increasing number of uh, temporary dwellers, tree changers and, and holiday dwellers from uh, Sydney and Melbourne and I guess I include myself in, in the tree changing temporary dweller category um, and there are a lot of artists in that area. But at the 2010 uh, festival, yeah, three years ago, uh, Sheena announced to the audience that Four Winds was fundraising to realise their vision of a truly world class venue and with a, within an hour, one music lover had donated the first $50,000. And to cut a long and incredibly inspiring story short, this 
extraordinary creature, the new Four Wind Sound Shell, a state-of-the-art $800,000 stage and amphitheatre designed by the celebrated architect Philip Cox, also a local and a music fan, complete with outdoor acoustic te technology, was erected in time for the 2,000 guests in the perfect weather of the Easter 2012 festival. But by the time they, they'd done this, they would become even more ambitious and they were working on phase two. This, that, that's the auditorium of the other sound shots are gorgeous. I like sitting back there. <laughs> um, okay, so nearly um, phase two, nearly $3 million of local and targeting, targeted fundraising, another $1 million in, uh, in pro bono donations, along with painstaking grant writing, support from Arts New South Wales, and $1.7 million regional development fund later, but in good time for the 2014 festival, the new Four Winds precinct will be open to the community. Gorgeous. Um, it will include uh, a new na nature's concert hall, a new purpose-built acoustically engineered rehearsal and recital pavilion for 160 people nestled into the landscape. <coughs> that, uh, this is a photo I took at the building site last week. Uh, it uh, overlooks the, the uh, amphitheatre that I just showed you. Um, yeah, surrounded by spotted gums and overlooking the new sound show and the rolling hills. And when it's not in use for the festival, um, this stunning new solar powered building will be used by the community for yoga classes, indigenous culture workshops, uh, conferences, theatre groups, and uh, all music of all kinds from local indie pop to ACO. One of the most exciting developments for me as the Chair of Southeast Arts is that the new performance environment is not only a resource for our whole region, but it connects us digitally to the world and is absolutely up there with the most beautiful places anywhere in the world to play music. Um, and I know yesterday we talked a lot about cultural tourism and both in the case of, of uh, Four Winds and in the case of Nehi, um, there are cultural tourism implications as you can imagine and Four Winds is working very closely with the Sapphire Coast Tourism Board and as, as does uh, uh, Nehi in Cornwall. So this is a huge success story. It's a real triumph for our plucky community and a fantastic example of regional aspiration in action. Whether people attend the festival or not, Four Winds presence and its insistence on excellence absolutely plays into a growing sense that ours is a community that sees itself notwithstanding its fishing, farming and forestry DNA and largely working class demographic as progressive, creative, adapted to, adapting to and interested in the world around us. Now I know not every community is a chamber music town but every community has its creative strengths and big ambitious ideas and I hope that other communities who dream of great things will take heart from Burmese's uh, example. And let me clarify that in using these examples, I'm not suggesting you need to do a huge fundraising campaign or go build a building um, or live in a barn on a cliff like, <laughs> like the Nehi uh, artists. What I'm talking about is a mindset. It's a more aspirational use of language that elevates them. I was having a chat to Sheena this morning and she just said, it was a very classic Sheena uh, quote, she said, I don't know why you wouldn't go for extraordinary over ordinary. Um, she, why can't we have be inclusive and excellent? Why can't we be accessible and brilliant? It's very simple and I, I agree with her. Um, and as for Opera Q, we're extremely serious about regional excellence. In our new strategic plan, our focus on regional activity has, has an absolutely equal value to our activity in metropolitan Brisbane and our new open stage community and education programs. Those three areas um, overlap and interconnect and the best possible example of this is Project Puccini, uh, our hugely ambitious two-year statewide community chorus pro project in for next year, in which you'll see Opera Q auditioning and rehearsing seven community choirs, eight if you count Brisbane, uh, of 36 adults and 12 children in the Gold Coast, Toowoomba, Maryborough, Rockhampton, Mackay, Townsville and Ma Ma Mount Isa. 
and in each town we'll contract a local chorus director and rehearsal coordinator with whom our team will work, cellist Tia Hukuma. This very special, I would say, luminous um, collaboration began its creative process in January, not in Townsville or Brisbane, but in Paris, uh, where choreographer Raywin Hill travelled to work with dancer France Hervé. And uh, reversing the normal flow of regional touring, um, Abandon had its premiere in Townsville a few weeks ago, but next year it will be seen in Brisbane, and there's already interest from international festivals. So how exciting to be taking work created in regional Queensland to the world. Like uh, Mike Shepherd from Knee High, I, uh, I see my home in regional New South Wales as a place where I, as an artist, can make things happen for my local audiences and for the world. As uh, artistic director of Opera Queensland, I, I want to make our regional, I want our regional audiences to experience the most excellent work and be inspired by working alongside excellent artists and musicians. I share Brian McMaster's view that the highest quality and the broadest audience can go hand in hand, and I'm optimistic that in time, our collective voice can influence a proportional rebalance of the resources allocated to regional and metropolitan arts. The local global thinking will have gathered momentum and uh, we'll be reading reclaimed words, like excellent, as uh, ambitious but appropriate des descriptors for the work that's being created in our communities. No doubt ours will continue to be work that helps make communities resilient, inclusive and co uh, cohesive and positive linking and unifying people from different backgrounds and circumstances, fostering understanding and building a common sense of purpose, but it will also be work that aspires to excellence. Regional arts is my passion. Regional Australia is my home. With much love and respect, I say, we are, this is a room full of leaders, artists, policy makers, we know the power of language to influence, to inspire, to lift up. Let's re-examine the language that we use and the next part of the narrative is ours to write. Thank you.